Okay, thank you very much. Thank you, Victor, and also thank the organisers for inviting me to give a talk at this really um, well, beautiful setting and a really interesting idea of having discussion rather than presentation. But um, let me carry on anyway. So I'm Paul Fremont. I'm the co-director of the Imperial College um, Synthetic Biology Hub. I have a great interest in how synthetic biology could be translated into useful uh, applications, but also, of course, in the spirit of this meeting, synthetic biology is an approach to understanding biology, and I think that's what I think Francois was mentioning earlier on. So my lab works on a number of different areas. I'm not going to be presenting uh, data from all of these areas, but I'm going to tell you a little bit about our work on cell-free platforms, and also some work that we've been doing more recently on pathway engineering in the spirit of what Victor did, and Victor gave a fantastic uh, introduction to some of the um, nuances, if you like, of synthetic biology and how we might take it forward, uh, harnessing biology explicitly. Okay, so, I mean, um, Victor mentioned a little bit about quotes, and so I thought I'd just quickly put in a couple of quotes. I found this article in the British Medical Journal in 1910, and it's a, a, a sort of quote, and I'll just read a little bit. It says, all natural sciences follow the same process of evolution. They begin by the observation and classification of natural objects and phenomena, and that's the descriptive stage, and I do feel often that biologists are still in the descriptive stage. Um, then they attempt to resolve these phenomena uh, to determine the cause of their production, and thus they become analytical. Um, and I think what this uh, gentleman was saying at the time was that uh, the idea of biological synthesis, the idea of going synthetic, um, is, is a really interesting one because biology has only reached the first two stages of, of dis description, if you like, and phenomena. Uh, and in that he said the idea of biological synthesis is a bold one, and yet it is no novelty. It has a cropped up in the imaginative literature of all ages, but considered as a scientific possibility. Its conception is a very recent date. So that was written in 1910. So if you wind forward, this is a very large quote, but it's again talking about synthetic biology. So this is the Polish geneticist, who I'm afraid I can't actually pronounce the name, so I apologize. But this is a famous sort of uh, quote, but this is uh, Wacław Szywalski, I think. That's his there. Um, and he's a Polish geneticist who came up with the idea in 1974 about, truly about synthesis and synthetic biology, because he says uh, here, uh, we will then devise new control elements, add these new modules to existing genomes and build up whole new genomes. I mean, this is essentially what we're doing now, and this was in 1974. Uh, and then he said, this would be a field with the unlimited expansion potential and hardly any limitation to building new, better control circuits, synthetic organisms, new, better mouse. I'm not concerned that we have run out of exciting novel, novel ideas in the synthetic biology in general. So he was very, very far ahead of his time. This was only a few years after Asilomar and the, the introduction of genetic engineering uh, and cloning. So this was a, a, a really interesting uh, insight that he had of where the field would go. But then what is all the fuss about society and regulators and European unions? And this is some of the, um, <laughs> the other literature, which we can't ignore, uh, and that is the, the, the public literature. This is what people read every day. And I, I grant you that some of this is from um, from the UK press, which has got a particularly bad reputation, but things like uh, scientists are cute of playing God after creating artificial life by making designer microbes from scratch, but could they wipe out humanity? Thank goodness they haven't yet, but anyway. Uh, reviving extinct species. Uh, this is from Friends of the Earth, extreme genetic engineering um, in your ice cream. It's a very evocative, provocative picture, if you like, of a pipette and a lovely, beautiful ice cream. Uh, and then this is probably one that uh, really was not very helpful, which is brewing bad, scientists find ways to cook up heroin at home. So this is creating quite a lot of fuss, and I think uh, we need to be aware of outside the, uh, this wonderful place that there are a lot of people there who have got great concerns about synthetic biology. <clears throat> However, um, so what is all the fuss about? Um, so synthetic biology, I think, uh, there are many definitions, and this is one definition which tries to capture what, uh, what Victor was saying about the idea of building, designing, and constructing, and redesigning biological systems, and there are many reports. Uh, this is the most recent European uh, um, operational definition, and there are some people, I think, in this room who were involved in this, and I think it really does capture uh, very nicely uh, uh, what synthetic biology is. It's the application of science, technology, and engineering to facilitate and accelerate design, manufacture and modification of genetic materials in living organisms. Um, so we have definitions. So that's kind of where Victor came 
from. Now, just to put it in context, this is the number of publications in synthetic biology that named synthetic biology as part of the field. This is since 2010. You can see it's rapidly rising. There are over uh, 47,000 papers. Um, this is the growth of the, um, the student competition called iGEM in synthetic biology, which I think there are teams from France and all over Europe and all over the world actually shown on this. Uh, so these are all young, excited, enthusiastic researchers who are spending their time uh, over the summer designing and building new biological systems. So you can see there's a huge growth there with almost 15,000 young people around the world have been through iGEM. Uh, and so, you know, it has this powerful um, vision, if you like, for merging engineering design and practice and all of the associated tools involved in that, including obviously mathematics, computational modeling, and all the other, um, what you call more hard, hard sciences, into the construction of biological systems and cells at the genetic and the protein level. I think that vision is very persuasive to a lot of people. So if we consider, I mean, Victor's already indicated this, but if we look at some of the very basics of engineering systems, um, clearly robustness uh, and stability are key for engineered systems. And these are often achieved by these sort of four premises where one has systems control, one has redundancy, obviously, in engineered systems, one also has sort of a mod an idea of modular design, and also one has this idea of structural stability within the system you're designing. Uh, now, the question is, you know, uh, how do we put that into the context of biology? So we think about that. We can think, well, systems control. We have quite a bit of information and understanding about how biological systems regulate themselves. So we have control circuits. We have feed-forward, feedback loops. We have control networks. We have interaction networks. We also have redundancy. We have multiple genes that can carry out similar functions. We also have multiple regulatory pathways. If one pathway doesn't work, often another pathway will kick in. We also tend to have modular design, these evolutionarily robust modules that get passed from uh, species to species. There's a functionality that's been solved, and then it will be evolved or inherited by other species. That does happen in biology. And then we often have uh, good structural stability, homeostasis. I mean, cells are incredibly good at regulating their uh, internal processes and, and, and life state, if you like. So I suppose, and a hypothesis might be, uh, are these features uh, intrinsic to all complex systems, whether they're natural and artificial? And I think one aspect of systematic engineering, if you like, for biology uh, will, will clearly test that hypothesis. So I suppose the question is, can we learn about biology through design and construction? So, you know, biological systems can be considered as modular, I think. Functions primarily encoded in DNA, uh, large knowledge of genome databases, large diversity of parts, if you like, increased understanding of molecular and cell biology at, 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 at all different resolution scales. New technologies to synthesize and assemble DNA, um, chemically synthesize. New computational tools to design and model, and obviously systems biology modeling and application comes into play here. However, I think it's important to realize that, and I think everyone in this, biologists in their room should know, and hopefully everyone knows, that you know, there's some real challenges for engineering biology. Uh, and one is context dependency. So the idea that genes will function uh, similarly depending on where they are within the genome is not uh, correct. Evolution, adaptation, and natural selection, these are very strong processes uh, This is uh, that will change biological systems depending on their environment. Non-predictive stochastic behavior, which is part of the evolutionary process, if you like. Self-assembly and emergent properties, non-linear dynamical processes, and multi-scale interactions. These are massive, massive challenges. Uh, and, it, and if you really boil it down, I mean, living cells are essentially constrained volumes and very high concentrations of biochemical components. I mean, that's it. Uh, and so therefore, you know, um, biology is not uh, plug and play. Um, you cannot take one component, put it in the context of another, and assume that it will predictably function as you uh, predict. This is not true, and it really poses problems. And illustrated here is just a, a, a sort of network map uh, for a really important uh, eukaryotic uh, mammalian signaling protein called mTOR, which is a PI3 kinase, which has functions in many different uh, aspects of a, of a mammalian cell, including uh, growth, including uh, all sorts of uh, functions within the cell itself. And I think you know, this is a, a, a beautiful uh, paper, by the way, 
showing the interconnectivities uh, within a mammalian system that, that does provide a huge challenge if one wants to start engineering a part of that system or re-perturb that system. This is also a major protein involved in, in cancer. So, as, as, um, as Victor said, one approach may be to overcome uh, this kind of, you know, almost uh, overwhelming uh, sense of complexity and bewilderment might be to try and develop some sort of systematic design process. And I think that's what, uh, that's what synthetic biology is trying to do. It's trying to build things in a sort of more systematic engineering process. So using things like modularization, so interchangeable parts, interchangeable modules, using things like standardization, can we standardize measurements, tools, or processes? And then using this idea of abstraction, which engineers use very successfully to try and sort of deconvolute complexity in some ways, to try and sort of allow people to uh, cope with complexity. Uh, and systematic design aims to achieve ultimately robustness and reproducibility. But as I said, these are huge challenges in biological systems. So, um, so we, this is uh, already shown uh, by Victor, and I think just to re-emphasize, it's a conceptual framework, it's not a literal framework. Uh, and it allows one to start thinking about biology at the genetic level as essentially functional genetic elements. And therefore, by building you know, repositories and understanding of these parts and putting these parts together in human-defined ways, just a simple transcription module, promoter, ribosome binding sequence, a protein, and a terminator, that's a module. Then one could consider that module to be uh, exemplified and analyzed and, and whatever uh, and characterized. That, that module could become part of uh, this idea of going from parts to devices and into systems. And I think this idea of abstraction hierarchy is actually a very powerful conceptual framework that allows one to start addressing this, this huge complexity that we're trying to deal with. This then leads on to this very um, 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 slightly simplistic, if you like, but very effective uh, design cycle where one can start doing systematic design, building, testing, learning, and of course the key aspect here is metrology, modeling uh, and, uh, sorry, metrology, data analysis and modeling, and obviously learning about that process. And these are key elements of this design cycle. And the design cycle, again, is a framework. It's not meant to be a literal uh, thing. It doesn't mean if you, you can build biological systems without doing this. But I think if you want to develop a systematic framework and learn about how you build biological systems, this idea of, of going through this systematic process is extraordinarily powerful and, and very useful. So I guess the big challenge is, and I'm sure this is going to cause a lot of discussion over the next few days, is you know, can we build new biological systems with standardized DNA parts? And already we are building uh, registries and repositories of parts with nomenclature that people can use and analyze both digitally and, uh, and functionally. Now, what about standards? So Victor led a, a beautiful project actually called STFLOW, a four-year European Union project on standards in synthetic biology, which is incredibly uh, incredibly useful bringing people together from all over Europe to look at standards. And I guess this is just a very simple standard. This is the, the first sort of thread standard by Joseph Whitworth, 1841. You could imagine how much impact the introduction of a standard and a screw and a nut had on the world at that time. It was a hugely important development, and there are many other standards. Now, I won't go through all these. These are sort of the, the sort of standards, if you like, that governments and consumers and businesses look for. But I think one key aspect is this idea of interoperability. And I think standards are directly linked uh, to measurement. I think we need to understand uh, that, you know, can we standardize the construction of living matter? And this is a very big question. And I'm sure we can spend the rest of the week talking about that, just that one question. Uh, that is a huge question. Um, and, and that is one of the, if you like, challenges and approaches that, that synthetic biologists are trying to address. Now, the reason that we think that the systematic approach might be beneficial is because I think people realize that biological research, unlike uh, my engineering colleagues' research or even chemistry and physics research, uh, is often irreproducible. And my, my, my colleagues in physics and, and, and engineering find it extraordinary that biologists actually live with this irreproducibility and can cope with it, but we do. Uh, and this is part of our you know, descriptive uh, storytelling, if you like, which we do very, very successfully. Not all, but certainly we do quite a lot of that. And I think it's clear that biological data can suffer from irreproducibility. Now, I think the reason for that is more a lack of technical standards and more a lack of 
sort of people doing the same thing constantly, using the same processes, using the same measurement tools, using the same strains, and learning about the variability within systems. So from the standards uh, consortium and our own thinking, I think you can think of standards as being possibly physical standards, DNA standards, possibly functional standards, you know, standard measurement conditions, standard culture conditions, standard strains, i.e. I'm using the same strain as Victor's using in Spain and we use in London. Uh, and sharing data, standard strains, and then, of course, standards within digital information so that we can share all of this information digitally. And I think these are really important. Now, I do want to point out that synthetic biologists do think that, you know, we all think we're really the new boys on the block. Uh, and, you know, let's, this is a very good cartoon. I don't think it will work. Let's do something different, something smarter, something cooler. And those kind of attributes do, do fit quite nicely with the synthetic biology. Um, so I think we need to think about systems biology. Uh, and um, the systems biology community have been going through exactly the same thinking that we are now approaching. <laughs> and I think there is some overlap here that we need to bring into play uh, and try and integrate both systems uh, biology thinking and synthetic biology thinking. So what do we measure, if you like? What would you measure in a biological uh, system? There are many different things we can measure, and no one really fully understands what we could measure everything, not quite everything, but pretty much everything. So in a biological system, you could measure you know, RNA transcripts quantitatively, proteins quantitatively. You can measure metabolites, lipids, glycans. You can get handles on post-translational modifications. Functional states are complicated, you know, epigenetic state, growth state. Uh, noise within biological systems, you can measure noise, spatial localization, protein-protein interaction networks, regulatory networks, trying to bridge between genetic space, protein space, and metabolite space. These are complicated um, uh, areas that one can try and develop models and, and try and develop understanding. So we can measure quite a lot using the omics technologies that we have now, but no one clearly knows yet, I don't think, what we need to measure to uh, to really improve our sort of design robustness, our design cycle. So this is where you kind of get this sort of synthetic biology uh, field going. There's this idea of a whole bunch of foundational technologies. You could reduce synthetic biology down to that, if you like, a whole bunch of synthetic biology uh, technologies, which are things like design tools, you know, to, to build new genetic circuits, the synthesis and assembly of DNA, the parts and device characterization and the standardized measurements and the whole kind of really meticulous measurement of your system and what's going wrong, what's working, uh, followed with this sort of very persuasive technology, CRISPR-Cas, genome editing screens, again, using the optimization of biology as a way to, uh, to understand the design, if you like, cycle. And then, of course, working on how do we characterize what is a, what is a sort of, you know, do we have standardized strains? Will we ever have standardized strains? Can we work towards some sort of standardized host uh, strain? So these foundational technologies, the idea is that they would fill into uh, different applications. And of course, the applications that people are very interested in now uh, are shown on here. These are not by no means complete, but there are a lot of work on foundational tools, therapeutics, novel drug delivery systems, agri-science, fine specialty chemicals, biomanufacturing, commodity chemicals and biomaterials, to mention but a few. Now, of course, uh, this has been uh, the area of industrial biotechnology for many years, so uh, synthetic biology is going to try and provide a new toolkit, if you like, to address some of those issues. So what are the current research trends? So when I looked through all that literature I showed you earlier, these are the kind of things that were coming out from the current synthetic biology literature. There is quite a lot of people working on refactoring and redesigning, genome editing, genome construction, automation standards and tools, and then some sort of quite a bit of literature also in some of the social sciences, it's about open source and descaling. There's quite a lot of work on that. There is a growing interest and excitement in the idea of creating alternative biological systems using exobiology, XNA, artificial cells and cell-free systems, this idea of building cells from the bottom up. And I think this is an area which is actually very, very interesting. And there is some kind of interesting integration of cell-free systems and the kind of alternative biological systems and what I would call more the mainstream uh, synthetic biology. So that leads me nicely onto work that we've been doing on cell-free systems, and I'm going to now just switch gear a little bit to what we've been doing on cell-free systems. So cell-free systems are really interesting because they are essentially the cell extract with the membrane peeled off and all of the ingredients within the cell extracted, the uh, genomic DNA removed, and essentially it contains ribosomes, some membrane vesicles, 
and some cellular proteins. So it's a crude sort of lysate, if you like, from a cell, but it has the great ability to be able to translate and transcribe DNA uh, within as a biochemical reaction and assay. So it takes out the life of a cell, if you like, but uses all the ingredients within the cell to carry, to, to carry out uh, reactions. So this is a sort of scaled down version, if you like. So what's interesting about cell-free systems is that you can use uh, part of the uh, glycolytic pathway, which is the ATP generating pathway that exists in cells, and also the TCA cycle is existing within cell-free extracts. But you can provide new energy sources. So one common energy source is 3-phosphoglycerate, but the people are working on cheaper energy sources. It's clear within cell-free systems you have components of oxidative phosphorylation, so you do have uh, the ability to create ATP within the system, although you do need to add an ATP regenerating system. You also need to add uh, amino acids uh, and other uh, essential cofactors to allow the system to kick off. But the point is that in, within that system, you can get uh, transcription and translation working quite reproducibly and robustly. Now, there is an alternative system, which is the PURE system, which was uh, a beautiful system, essentially first uh, published by some Japanese colleagues that went to the effort of purifying all of the machinery of transcription and translation and reconstituting that in a test tube, if you like. That's the sort of, you know, not only is it pure, it's, it, it's sort of, uh, you know, beautiful science, if you like, of reconstructing uh, the basic components that would allow transcription and translation to occur in a test tube. The disadvantage of the pure system is it's extremely expensive and awfully difficult to get running routinely in the lab, but it is a, a beautiful system nonetheless. Um, so what are the advantages of cell-free systems? So you can do transcription translation, you can do DNA circuit prototyping, you can use them for biosensors, uh, environmental testing, we've got some projects on that. You can actually do enzyme pathways for fine chemical uh, and drug production. You can make recombinant proteins and you can do toxic pathways. It is scalable, you could scale it up to a thousand liters as shown by Sutro Biopharmaceuticals, but it is probably best if you're thinking about producing products that are high value, low volume products. Now the metabolism is simple and cheap and it's easy to modify, so you can do all sorts of interesting things within cell-free systems. So as a, as a test bed, it's a very useful system uh, to, to operate. And in the context of what I described earlier in synthetic biology, if you were prototyping parts, um, a few years ago we had this idea, well, if you've got all these parts, you want to measure the uh, functions or the, the quantitation of a promoters or ribosome binding sequences or whatever, you know, to do this using standard molecular biology, it's sort of a long process, and we wanted to speed that up and see if we could explore whether the information we got from in vitro systems was very similar to the information we got from in vivo systems. Uh, so we set about doing that as if we could use it as a prototyping. And uh, this is the idea of taking parts, doing all of the molecular biology activity, you know, the ligations, the transformations, the liquid cultures, the growing, the measurement. It's a very tedious process. Uh, so the idea was if we want to do, if synthetic biology is going to become this kind of engineering field, you want to have thousands of parts characterized to some level of quantitation so that you can inform the various modeling uh, aspects of the field. So we decided a few years ago, James Chappell, a PhD student, to look at that in detail. So we took a bunch of parts, a bunch of promoters, a bunch of ribosome binding sequences, uh, and we hooked them all up to a GFP reporter, and we did a very, very simple experiment. We measured the GFP, if you like, uh, production uh, in, a, uh, in vivo, in a steady state uh, expression system mid-log. Um, and then uh, using BL21D3, using M9 minimal media, 30 degrees, we took the same cell-free extract from BL21D3, uh, 30 degrees, but obviously it's a completely different reaction. And we measured the production of GFP from the same parts in the same context in both systems. Now, to our surprise, we found uh, on this side that the uh, measurements of GFP, the relative measurements, the relative production of GFP, between in vivo and in vitro were similar. Um, we were quite surprised, obviously significant error, there are some sort of largest <laughs> error bars, but the relative strengths of some of the promoters shown over here, you can see that you know, in vivo is in the gray and in vitro is in the white, and you're getting kind of sort of nice, uh, relatively uh, good uh, correlations between in vivo and in vitro, and it was the first um, uh, time we'd, we'd I, I was unexpected. 
And we also did some reducible promoters, and we got similar data, and we published this, so I won't spend too much time. At the same time, a whole bunch of other papers came out as well, and there was this sort of acceptance, if you like, or not proposition, sorry, proposition that said that for simple DNA regulatory parts, uh, the, the ones that have been studied, they showed similar kind of functionality, similar quantitative uh, behaviors in vitro and in vivo, which was quite surprising. However, as all biology shows you, this is not the case. So now, this is a, a library screen of promoters we've been doing recently, uh, and we found uh, some really quite extraordinarily uh, strong library. This is an in vitro, uh, this is an in vivo screen, and we found, uh, sorry, an in vitro screen, and we found some really, really strong promoters. There's no, no, no need to look at the data, but it was an extremely strong promoter. And it turned out that, uh, and here it is here, this is the normal uh, Kelly promoter down here, and this is the promoter we found. It's a really uh, un unexpected uh, observation as we were, again, this descriptive nature of biology, as we went through all of these uh, different sequences, we found this extraordinarily high promoter. And I think what was interesting about it, as shown here, just shown here, uh, when we went to look in vivo, uh, we could not replicate uh, at all that uh, promoter strength. It looks like it's the same promoter strength as the Kelly promoter down here in vivo. Uh, and you know, there are all sorts of reasons. We're exploring why that is. Subsequent to that, uh, Zach, Sun, and others came up and said, well, actually, there, this, this does break down. So this idea of in vivo, in vitro does break down. So I guess the way I could pitch that would be, well, could we, you know, could we use this in vitro, in vivo kind of comparison? as a way to tell us about context dependency. And I think that's something we're going to explore with this, uh, this uh, very, very high uh, producer, this promoter, which is essentially two base changes, which is quite extraordinary. <laughs> and we need to work out why that is. So then we're making cell-free extracts from different cells. We're going to explore cell-free extracts as a platform. We're going to try and compare them from E. coli, uh, different strains of E. coli. So this is MG, this is Rosetta, BL21s. Uh, looking to see if we can learn about any of the, the sort of uh, phenotypic functionalities of cell-free extracts. This is now Bacillus subtilis, which we've uh, managed to get optimized, uh, and we're going to be looking at Bacillus subtilis as well. And then this is, uh, that's the optimization of Bacillus subtilis. Uh, and then we're going to be looking at Bacillus megatherium, which is a very interesting organism. Uh, it has been thought of as a very uh, important organism, potentially, in, for an industrial production setting, and we're doing this in collaboration with colleagues at the Braunschweig Technical University. And so we've made a cell-free extract from Bacillus megatherium, and we're getting extremely good uh, production of proteins within the Bacillus megatherium. Now, uh, in the context of that approach, we're also uh, developing some um, real-time measure RNA measurements, and the idea here is to try and provide quantitative data that would allow you to assess uh, the cell-free system in a more quantitative mathematical way, a modeling way, uh, and we are, we are getting very nice data showing you get very nice bursts uh, and decays of messenger RNA. We're also looking at uh, trying to do very, very high throughput analysis. So this is on our echo liquid handler. So this is 108 conditions in triplicate three times DNA, six times repressed six times juices, uh, and we've been developing a model. So one of my uh, senior researchers in my lab is a, a physicist, actually, originally, and he's been developing a mathematical model to try and uh, develop. Um, a, this is the model here. It's a Bayesian statistical in inference model. It's around trying to, do, to, trying to map out the parameters that we don't know uh, at all within our system, what they might be. Uh, and the modeling parameters that we're interested in is polymerase binding, mesh RNA synthesis, mesh RNA degradation, and then GFP synthesis, GFP maturation. So this is Jamie McDonald's work. Uh, and the idea here is that we can start doing simulations as well as experimental observations. And of course, here, we can start providing the quantitative details <laughs> that would allow that model to uh, become much more, um, um, not better, but sort of more informed, if you like, on, on experimental data. And so, I think cell-free systems, uh, so here's the kind of summary of that, if you like. So cell-free systems, I think, are a very useful test bed to explore part of the design cycle of synthetic biology, but they're also a very good test bed to start and develop uh, slightly simplified models uh, in a non-living system, but having all the central sort of, sort of broken down parts of, of life, if like, in terms of metabolism. So we've been developing a, a whole extract model here. This is James's work doing experiments, metabolomics, trying to infill this model, and also doing proteomics as well to build up a cell-free 
kind of scenario. And then we'll be comparing that with our different cell extracts to see if this breaks down depending on the particular extract. But it's, uh, yeah. Okay, so, I mean, that leads on to the obvious question, I think, which a lot of people are interested in, which is could we build a cell from the bottom up using sort of subsystems, if you like, maybe using cell-free systems? Uh, and if you break down a cell, I think this is the idea of modularity, functional modularity. And here you can see, uh, if you break down a cell, a very simple bacterial cell, there are discrete components that you can think about. So there are actuation, uh, sensing, so sensing, actuation, export communications with the outside, regulation and computation within the cell, signaling and metabolism. And I think, I think one of the challenges and one of the exciting challenges I think cell-free and synthetic biology per se can, can, can offer is to try and develop uh, sort of these subsystems, so, you know, sort of to build these subsystems and see if they can uh, work. Now, clearly, uh, subsystems that involve a membrane compartment will be difficult, but we can certainly start looking at regulation and computation or even some uh, metabolic subsystems within the cell-free system, and that's one of the, the goals that we're going to be moving into in collaboration. Okay, so finally, um, I'm not sure how long I've got left. You have, like, if you have... Um... Okay, so finally, I just want to go into some work we've been doing on uh, pathway engineering uh, here. Now, I think everyone realizes that cells can be used as uh, uh, metabolic factories, and that's been around a long time. Uh, it's been around so long that we forget that industrial biotechnology has been with us for, you know, 5,000 years maybe, or a few thousand years or whatever, since we started making wine, I guess. But anyway, it's, it's a very, very uh, sophisticated uh, industry that has been using cellular systems to produce and manufacture components uh, and some really major pharmaceutical components as well. So I guess uh, when you look at industrial biotechnology, uh, you can see that all of these products that we take kind of for granted, there are components within these products that uh, are being or can be manufactured using uh, biological systems. So uh, it's very apt that we just had the climate change big convention in Paris just the other day. Everyone's very excited about moving to this non-petroleum-based uh, world that we're going to, all going to have to live in. And a clearly, industrial biotechnology has a in massively important role and synthetic biology uh, to provide the components and chemical entities that we all need for all of these everyday life systems or we, or we, or we adapt our lives to, to not live with them, which is going to be difficult. So, of course, scale-up is a huge problem in industrial biotech, um, and, and it still continues to be. And, and I think that is one of the big challenges, I think, that synthetic biology is going to have to uh, try and address, because it's okay doing stuff in the lab. So the question is, can synthetic biology accelerate the construction and prototyping of synthetic pathways for the production of products, if you like? Uh, and these are the kind of uh, areas, I think, that are important for pathway engineering. So we have bioinformatics, clearly, flux modeling, combinatorial pathway assembly, metrology, in vitro in vivo, and chassis host cells, and then we need to go through this testing and prototyping. So we've been doing some work on a new uh, kind of Golden Gate-based E. coli kit for part assembly, which we're just about to publish. And the idea here is that we can accelerate the production of different pathways, different combinatorial circuits. This is based on Golden Gate. And it's a sort of plasma kit that we can use for many different uh, range of applications. And we put in all sorts of uh, variants into the system. And the Golden Gate assembly strategy, busy slide, is extremely um, uh, powerful technology. It's been used around a lot. It's a fantastically systematic way of assembling multiple, multiple components. There are other methodologies for assembly, but I think Golden Gate gives you quite a lot of uh, combinatorial variations. So we've made a Golden Gate kit for E. coli. Uh, where we can start assembling uh, these uh, uh, modules, which can then be assembled into pathways and into greater modules shown here. We've also put in some variants in the system to allow you, when you're doing combinatorial assembly, that you can keep some of the components constant and then just assemble certain parts of the system, which I think could be very useful. We put in various <laughs> other things uh, like uh, protein purification tags and all sorts of other things. So. Uh, we're hoping to submit that to Agene, so hopefully everyone will be able to uh, access that and, and find it uh, useful like we found it useful. So um, we've been thinking about products, and clearly there are a lot of interesting products that people are manufacturing and making, very, very complex uh, products. 
But we wanted to develop more of the platform technology to allow us to see how would we make a pathway. So we chose something called Raspberry Ketone. I really like raspberries, as, uh, and there is this sort of product here that comes out of raspberries, which is essentially gives you the, the, uh, the, the sort of essence of, of what raspberries are. Now, obviously, there are various economic factors, but we just wanted to look at this pathway. We're not really interested in that. We're more interested in using the pathway as a simple um, prototype and test bed. So here we do our combinatorial DNA assembly, we do the cell-free prototyping, we do high-throughput LCMS, and then we bring in uh, structural biology and other aspects into the process. So here's the pathway. It's quite a simple five-enzyme pathway, sorry, four-enzyme pathway here, and there's a other enzyme involved here. Uh, it's, it starts at tyrosine, and it goes to the raspberry ketone through a series of enzymatic uh, conversions. Uh, you can also come in from a chemical, 4-hydroxybenzaldehyde, uh, you can do a chemical process to produce this uh, hydroxybenzylacetone com uh, component, which can then go to, f to form the raspberry ketone. So it's a, it's a, sort of, it's a biochemical pathway, enzymatically uh, catalyzed, uh, produces a, a, a natural component, so we were just using it as a test bed. So the first thing we did is we purified all the enzymes and we did very pure in vitro biochemistry. So here are all the enzymes here uh, and all this is worked so on published. So these are the four enzymes we purified. We then uh, increased tyrosine, uh, pro this is the substrate concentration, and then we looked to see uh, what we produced over time uh, and in terms of the concentration <coughs> of the products. And you can see here that just from this very simple, pure, this, is the, this is the enzymes themselves all together, Put in substrate, get out product. You can do very simple Michaelis Menten modeling, all the sort of modeling on this, and you find that actually there is some um, sort of product inhibition uh, in this uh, pathway where you get this four accumulate, uh, accumulating where the product as a function of increased tyrosine concentration. So, a very uh, simple um, observation, but a very important observation if you're trying to build a pathway uh, in vivo. We then did some screening with different uh, ribosome binding sequences uh, using our Golden Gate uh, EcoFlex system. And again, in vivo, and these are just a series of ribosome binding strengths and different promoters on different genes, we were finding different outputs from the production process. So, so combinatorially, we were finding actually the product is in red, uh, and that's the product we're trying to increase the yield of, clearly. Uh, and we were finding all sorts of interesting correlations in here between ribosome strength and different uh, intermediate products and different products. Uh, and clearly, we're interested in trying to develop a, a, more, a more intrinsic uh, understanding of that in terms of a model. But in general terms, what we find is that uh, particular combinations of promoters uh, are uh, producing different sort of points within the pathway where we're getting uh, product getting caught up, we're getting product inhibition, we're getting uh, all sorts of uh, interesting and unexpected uh, um, uh, outcomes that we didn't know. Then we decided to try and do some structural biology, and we built this uh, model into a crystal structure where we're trying to change the requirement for NADPH to be NADH. So we've now got a very nice mutant here, which can use NADH instead of NADBH as one of the components in the pathway. So I guess uh, from this engineering kind of like pathway engineering approach, I think what what, what, I, what we're beginning to realize is that this, the, the landscape of data space that you need to explore in a four enzyme pathway to try and optimize the uh, product production, if that's your target function, uh, is actually a very, very large space indeed. And there are many, many different nuances and unexpected consequences of uh, changing various parameters, which I think Victor alluded to in his very nice introductory slide. Uh, and clearly, you could start thinking about maybe uh, applying weights, if you like, which is kind of what we're trying to do here. And so having a mathematical formulation around where to go next, what to explore, what to change uh, in this kind of um, design would be extremely useful. Okay, so um, I think uh, from our initial sort of unpublished data so far, refactoring pathways requires, I think, multiple approaches. Uh, promoter strengths, we find, are often inversely correlated to the production. So you think if I have high production of different enzymes, I'm going to produce, but that clearly is not the case. And, and there, are all, there is clearly a, a lot of unknowns, and I think that's been well understood in the literature. Um, Self-free assays, I think, have been helping us to make decision points along that uh, reaction pathway. And if you want to just to finish up now on the challenges moving forward for the field, and, and uh, this is more of a discussion point, I think, um, if we are going to become a kind of sort of more engineering type of field, I think we need to develop technical standards. We need to have 
sharing of parts. We need to have parts that are shared between multiple labs, multiple groups, ever in the world, openly, easily, uh, so that we can learn from all of the information that we need uh, to make uh, this process become much more systematic and predictable. We need to share, I think, detailed data on failures and successes. So uh, the great thing about biology, and, and I'm not sure this is true in other sciences, but certainly in biology, we never share our failures. Um, and to be honest, most time in biological experiments don't work, um, probably 90% of the time, if not more, they don't work and we, don't, and, and we, and we ignore it. Uh, and so we need to start thinking about failure uh, and sharing that and looking to see what works, what doesn't work. Uh, and we clearly need to integrate systems biology thinking and, 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 and approaches to try and really harness what's already been done in systems biology into synthetic biology. Uh, and those are just some of my own thoughts. So I've rushed through a lot of stuff there, but I just hope to give you uh, a, a flavor of some of the things we're doing in the lab and, and how cell free is producing to be an, a, a really extremely powerful technology. And the work I described is Richard Calwick, Jane McDonald, Simon Moore. Uh, and we're funded, and thank you very much for your attention. Thank you.